I will start with a question the time they find a, a solution. I'm interested in the relationship uh, between Faculty 1000 and Faculty and the Faculty 1000 research, because this thing is new, is, a, is in fact a new company Good. wanting to publish papers and being paid for it, that's fine. But is there not a potential conflict of interest between both? Because the Faculty 1000 is a kind of self-selected organization that decide that they will evaluate you and in in as more as paper we suppose maybe that some people will try to publish there then it could be that i expect that then in the faculty of thousand there will be an interest because it's the same company to get those paper being considered self-selected as we discovered that they were of quality because i i took note of the language you use you said faculty 1000 is discovering mm -hmm. published quality research, which is a very in interesting word. You're not discovering it. Papers are published, they are read. You self-select a group which decides uh, performatively, we say this paper is good. So there will be a conflict of interest between the two parts. Or if there is not, I would like you to explain to me. Thanks. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll get into the last part first before I forget. So the word discovery, it's really meant um, to indicate that the service is for researchers to help them discover what other people recommend. So that's what discovery refers to. So you as a researcher can go there to discover what other people have recommended. Um, as for the conflict of interest, within F1000 Prime, F1000, there's a long list of journals. We have just have a list of all the journals and the faculty members can, um, actually the associate faculty members, so that's the younger ones, the postdocs usually, they, um, they often look at specific journals, so they're people who specifically look at the table of contents for cell or they specifically look at nature genetics. And there's a whole list of journals and all the new associate faculty members get to see that list and they pick journals that they want to look at the table of contents. F1000 Research is on the list, it's with all the other journals, but it's not in any way um, preferred over the other journals. The associate faculty members have no interest in picking F1000 Research over any other journal. And as far as I've heard, so the latest I've heard was a few months ago, nobody has picked F1000 Research yet. So it's just on the list for them to choose from. It's treated the same way. Um, the faculty members that are also on our advisory board, um, they can, if they happen to be a reviewer for one of the articles, they can then say, oh, actually, I really like that. I want to also recommend it. That has, I think, only happened once or twice. And if you look at the percentage of the articles of F1000 Research that are recommended versus other journals, it's, um, it's actually still lower because it's a new journal, but there's definitely no bias. And you can see all those numbers. If you just search for different journals in F1000 Prime, you can see the number of recommendations. And I'm, we are very aware that people might think that there is going to be a conflict of interest. So I invite you to keep an eye on it. And if you think that there are too many recommendations from F1000 Research, you can let us know. Thank you very much for, for your presentation, Eva. I have actually three questions. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, uh, you mentioned uh, at some point that uh, F1000 covers between 2 and 3 percentage of all the yeah. uh, life science literature. I, I, I agree with this, uh, with this figure. Yeah. But I would like to know your opinion on what, what could be the, well, the consequences of the, or the challenge that the, this small coverage of, of the literature could have in the use of F1000 as a which is evaluation tool. Mm -hmm. The second question is much, much simpler. You say you only collect uh, or you only cover or include uh, positive recommendations. Mm -hmm. yeah. I would like to know why. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so because I can see uh, advantages also in having negative uh, yeah. recommendations. And, and, and the third one is, uh, so I would like to understand better the, the, the business model of uh, F1000 research. So I would like to know who pays what as maybe a potential uh, model for other uh, journals in, in the future. Well, well a, the last one much. is easiest, so I'll answer that one first. Um, the business model of F1000 Research is very similar to that of a lot of other open access journals in that um, we have an 
author pays model, and I put author pays in quotation marks because very often it's not the author themselves, but it's their funder or their research institute who ends up paying. Um, and institutes can um, sign a membership deal. So for example, University College London has signed an agreement that their researchers, if they want to publish an F1000 research, they don't have to pay the fee, the university will cover it, we'll, we can send them the bill. And that's very similar to models that a lot of other open access journals use. Um, the first question, the two to three percent, um, so that's an average. On, and the, the one problem that at least I personally see with it um, is that we ask researchers to pick the most interesting papers that they've read. And there is a bias inherent in them reading a paper from nature versus a paper from proceedings of the tiny subfield of the even tinier subfield that they will think that, oh, this is published in nature, this must be important. So if you look at these recommendations, there is a very strong bias towards papers still from the top journals. And we do have the hidden gems section, which is looking at the other journals. But we think there should still be more papers in those smaller journals, statistically speaking, that are also really interesting. So um, I think that's the biggest problem with it. It's not so much the number. And the number is really a side effect of how much they can feasibly do on the side of their actual job. Um, so this is the number that naturally came out of us asking people, write about the things that you find really interesting and apparently that's two to three percent of what they read. Um, uh, what was your second question again? I forgot that one. Oh yes, why are they only positive? Um, yeah, that was really because we wanted to build a resource that says, hey, this is what these people like to read. Um, at the time, in 2002, you have to remember this is a long time ago, there was no such thing as discussions about post-publication peer review to the extent that there is now. There was no PubMed comments, there was no PubPeer, there were no blogs, there was no Twitter. So that recent um, trend of having a lot of post-publication discussion that can also be negative, that wasn't happening at the time. We have noticed, um, and I can give you a, a famous example from earlier this year, we have noticed that sometimes papers get recommended, but then actually the paper turns out to be wrong. Um, so this year, in January, there was this article about STAP stem cells. Um, if you put cells in an acid bath, they turn into stem cells. Um, it turned out to be not true. There were lots of associated drama, which I won't go into. But um, at the time, when the paper came out, a lot of our faculty members said, this is amazing. This is completely going to change stem cell science. And they wrote glowing recommendations. But then they started thinking about it more, and they started seeing the criticisms, and they thought, Maybe I was wrong. So if you go, if you look up that paper in, um, in F1000 Prime, you'll find some interesting things. You'll see faculty members who have retracted their recommendation. You'll see faculty members who have edited their recommendation. And you can see, I think that paper also has, um, it's, it's called dissent. If a faculty member absolutely disagrees with another faculty member's recommendation, they can dissent that and they can comments and say, I absolutely do not agree, this paper is not good at all, and here is why. So there is some level of negative comments, but it's only visible on the ones that all have all, are already in there. And because we ask people to pick their favorite papers, they're never negative comments to begin with. They're always after the fact. <laughs> Last question. Um, Yanis Aliferis, University of Nice, Sofia Antipolis. Thank you for your nice presentation. The previous talk ended with an open question mm -hmm. about editors. What do editors oh, yes. do? Yeah, I was actually, I was going to mention that. Yes, I, um, I didn't have <laughs> time to give an one answer. Is that also they collect uh, signed forms of copyright transfer. Mm -hmm. That means that the intellectual property of uh, the work of researchers is transferred without any counterpart to the editors. And uh, okay. we are all prisoners of this system, but yes. if you think about that, it's enormous. I mean, it's free lunch for the editors. Mm. It's as if you, you pay somebody to construct the house, and at the end you sign the form and say, okay, I give this house to somebody else. It's not, uh, it does, doesn't belong to me, to the institution anymore. 
So my question is, uh, what is your policy about that? Okay. Who owns the copyright? Um, the author owns the copyright, so you don't transfer copyright. Um, the articles are published under a Creative Commons license, and author retains all copyright, so they can do with it whatever they want. Okay, that's great news. Thank you. Bon, moi je crois que on va on va rem... alors Manuel, <laughs> tu peux aller là, pas devant. <laughs> That's just one question. Wouldn't it be interesting to make a mapping study? Just I think about the model of biomed experts, for instance, to see which kind of relationship there may be between the recommended and the recommending people. Is there any kind of network in the shadow? I see like co-authors in other publications or uh, cartography or mapping of that would be interesting. Did you ever think about that? Um, it, it would be interesting. I don't know if we've ever done that. It's not that I know of anyway. I don't know if it was done at some point previously. Um, we do always keep an eye on whether the faculties in the... So each, each subject area is divided into smaller subject areas and they all have their faculty members. Um, if we think that they all know each other and they're all friends, we invite new ones. So we're trying to get um, as much diversity as possible. And because we don't know all the fields, we really rely on researchers to tell us if they think there is a bias like that. If someone thinks that their papers are never recommended because the only faculty members in their discipline are people who hate them, they should tell us and we will find some more faculty members. Because it's, it's hard for us to know everything about every little field and researchers are responsible for keeping an eye on that. 